to, to, to see these truths of you, Lord. You'd help us to uh, apply them, Lord. You'd help us to study and to more earnestly desire to follow you. In your name, amen. amen. All right, if you would turn in your Bibles to John chapter 4, John chapter 4, it is my privilege and pleasure to be here. Um, Pastor Kip served on my ordination committee and uh, has has been a blessing to our church, um, probably in ways that he doesn't even know, so I'm privileged to just share the pulpit with him here. Um, John chapter 4. Um, we're going to be considering this together. Uh, as I understand, you've been going through passages of John in preparation for Easter as it comes towards us fairly quickly uh, this year. Um, we're going to be looking at uh, really verses uh, 5 through 42, but we'll start reading at, cha- at uh, verse 1 just to get some context with us here. Um, so verse 1, chapter 4, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus Wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me that water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me. 
the woman is co- the the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who has sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest. Look, I, will, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages, gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not, did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into that, their labor." Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I have ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this indeed is the Savior of the world. Would you pray with me? Uh, Father, as we consider your word, um, Lord, I pray that you would help me to be um, clear and helpful. Um, Lord, would you help us to um, see the truth and to feel it in our affections? And Lord, would you, by your spirit, give us a greater love for your son that we did not have already through this text. Lord, we love you, and it's in your son's heaven, and we pray by the spirit. Amen. Well, there is a, hum- uh, a common human problem, I think, that we all know and feel, and that is the desire to be satisfied. Um, it is such a, a universal problem that it even made it into, like, uh, the new Broadway play, Hamilton. Um, you will never be satisfied is, like, three of the songs in that play. This woman is no doubt any different. She is looking for a way in this world to be satisfied. And when she comes to the well, she finds a great surprise, and that is that she will be satisfied forever. And the world often promises us, in many, many different things, satisfaction, whether that's through money. You know, if you just work really hard and you earn this amount of money, then you'll really just be happy forever. And that satisfaction lasts about a day. Or if you just buy this house, then you'll really just be happy because you'll finally have a place to call your own, and that satisfaction lasts until something breaks. Yeah. The world and all of its promises are empty and vain. Jeremiah says that when we look to those things, we dig for ourselves empty cisterns that give us no water. And what Christ promises in this passage here is that he can give us eternal, everlasting satisfaction in the water that he gives. So as we go through this text here, uh, there really is just two sections of the text that John presents to us. The first is just the promise of everlasting water, and the second is the call to go and present that water to others. Okay, so the first section really lasts from uh, verses uh, 5 through <clears throat> verses um, 26. Okay, 5 through 26, and this is going to be the first section we look at here. Now, Jesus is leaving um, Jerusalem. He's leaving Judea, and he's going up. Um, We don't find out where he's going, really, until, um, well, he's going to Galilee, 
and he's going to go through Samaria. He says he's required in verse 4. He had to pass through Samaria. Very literal translation could say he was required to pass through Samaria. I think we're meant to believe that Jesus by the Father is instructed to go to this place to meet this woman. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Now this takes some knowledge of Genesis. Um, so you have to grab hold of your Old Testament here and remember where we're at. Um, in, the, in Genesis, this area is called Shechem. It's the same place. It's near Mount Gizarim, which is going to come up in this passage as well. And Jacob's well is there. So when Jacob buys a property there, uh, he makes a well there. This is also where he meets his wife. At this well, he draws water for her and for the cattle and the sheep. Um, and this is where this is all taking place. Verse 6, Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Now, the sixth hour is about noon, okay? Now, when I was reading this text in preparation for this week, the immediate question I had was, why is that even an important detail? Why does this matter? Um, and really, I think the main reason it matters is because John, as an author, is trying to link us to Genesis. We ought to be thinking about Jacob and his wife at the well as we're reading this. We're reading it at Jacob's well. There's already a hint. Well, it's Jacob meets his wife at noon, which is when Jesus meets this woman. And Jacob offers to draw water for this woman as Jesus offers to give water also to the Samaritan woman. Verse 7, A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. Now this woman is coming at noon, which is the hottest part of the day. I think we all know that. Um, I'm from the south, so we really know that noon is hot, okay? This is when the sun is, is, is right above us. There's not really any shade. You can't get away from it. And you'll notice that this woman is coming alone. Nobody goes up. This is a, quite a hike. Nobody comes up and hikes up to draw water um, at the hottest part of the day. So this woman is probably an outcast, not welcome in uh, with the rest of her kinsmen, and we get a comment in verse 8, his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. So that's why his disciples aren't there. Verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. This is true. It's very common in this point when Jesus is living, the Samaritans and the Jews don't get along. There are, are some places where it even results in bloodshed, their disagreements. Okay, it's believed that the Samaritans are sort of, um, you know, maybe they trace back to Jacob and through Joseph, but they're really mixed with Gentile blood, and so they're unclean to the Jews. And so for a Jew to talk to a Samaritan woman is scandalous. Scandalous. This woman is right. She's not wrong. Jews don't deal with Samaritans. And she's probably just thinking, who's this Jewish dude meeting me in a well, asking me for water? Who does he think he is? Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. So this is the first, uh, this isn't even an invitation, but just if you had known who I was, you would have asked the right questions. Right? If you had known that you were staring into the face of the gift of God, give, I think the gift of God is Christ himself in this text. And he says, if you would have known who I was, woman, you, you don't know what I can do for you. Verse 11, the woman responds. woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get the living water? Now, she's taking this far too literally. Obviously, Jesus is not being literal. He's being metaphorical. He's using a word picture. Living water is not real water. We're going to find out later what that means. Um, but she takes it literally. She says, you don't have a bucket or anything to get water with. How are you going to give me water? Also, you just asked me for water. Verse 12, are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Now, she says, she's reasoning with him. Jacob came, and he drank from the well, and you're telling me 
you don't need drinks from this well, but you have living water. You're better than our father Jacob. And let me say quickly that he is far better than Jacob ever was. Jacob may have been a covenant holder. He may have been a promised son, but he was nothing like the Savior of the world we're looking here at here. This is the gift of God to the world. Let's keep reading. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So this water, the water you drink from a well, the water you drink from your water bottle sitting here today, you're going to have to take another drink. You're going to be thirsty again. Anything that the world offers you to be satisfied in, you're, never, you're going to be unsatisfied again. But there is a water which Jesus offers here, which if you drink from it, you will never thirst again. You will never want for anything again or anyone else ever again. This water satisfies the human soul to its deepest cracks. And Jesus says when he gives you this water, that water becomes in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now there's a play here, um, and it's hard to see in English, so bear with me here. Um, throughout the text, as we talk about Jacob's well and the place where she's drawing water, there are two different Greek words being used. There's one word for spring, and there is one word for well. And then both of these words are being used by Jesus here. So Jacob's well is along a, a live spring with water flowing into it. And it is also a place where water sits as an actual well. And Jesus is saying, in the same way that Jacob's well is a spring that brings life into it, and it sits in the well, in the same way when he pours this living water into the soul of the human, it dwells with them and it springs up. It dwells in them and it springs up. And we're going to see that well up out of this woman when she goes back into her city and preaches this water. He's told me everything that I ever did. He must be the Christ. Now, the question, I think, natural question is just, what is the water? How do I get this water? Um, and in John 7, um, John actually answers this question pretty easily for us. So in John 7, 37, on, that, on, the day of, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. It was the same invitation. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who, had believe, who believed in him were to receive. So, John tells us, he gives us commentary on what he's writing here. What does he mean living water will flow out of his heart? He means he will have the Spirit of God. I think that's what Jesus means here. Jesus says, I offer you something that the world cannot offer you, and that is the Spirit of God, that God will dwell with you and he will be his temple. And that's why this spring leads to living water, or sorry, eternal life. The woman said to her, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to drink water. Now she's, she's asking for the water, but she's asking for just two reasons. I don't want to be thirsty anymore, and I don't want to have to come out here again. These are the wrong reasons to come to Christ. And let me say to you, if you are here and you have come simply because it makes your father happy or because uh, you think you will have a happy life just by attending church, this is the wrong way to come to Christ. There is a right way to come to him and there is a wrong way. And this is the wrong way. The right way is to come to him and say, the world does not satisfy me and my sin is an empty pit but I need that living water because I need Christ. And Jesus is going to push her a little bit more into this. He's pushing on the point. And he's going to get a little bit more closer to home here. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. I think what he's doing is he's making her come to reality with her sin. He's showing her, look how thirsty your soul is. Go get your husband. 
She says, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying you have no husband. Now, she didn't tell the whole truth, but for you have had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. So this woman, maybe I don't, we don't know the situation of these other husbands, um, whether it was divorce or uh, being widowed. We don't know. Either way, in Samaria or in Judea, this is not a good thing. Generally, culturally, there's something wrong with you if you've gone through five husbands in a lifetime, and now you're living with a man who's not your husband. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And she still doesn't get it. He has said, I'm the gift of God. He has said, I give you water which will satisfy you forever. And now he's told her what he's not supposed to be able to know as a Jew. And she says, you've got to be a prophet or something. She missed it. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. She's changing the subject here, 20. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. But you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Now, she's assuming Jesus, what Jesus believes about worship. She doesn't know Jesus. She's not asking questions. She's just assuming, you're a Jew, you believe this. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me. The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. Let's stop here. Um, the Samaritans haven't been able to worship, worship God in any sort of way at this point for 100, uh, 150 years. So their temple, which was on the mountain where she points, Mount Gerizim, their temple was destroyed in 127 B.C. So since then, they've been sort of without worship, unable to worship God in any way. And they're not allowed in the temple by the Jews. So they're sort of hopeless, waiting for this Messiah figure to come, which they have a different Messiah figure named Tabeh, waiting for him to come to deliver them and give them a way to worship God. And so for Jesus to say he's wor that the Father's seeking for true worshipers, will worship in spirit and in truth, and to say there's no holy site anymore to go to. There's no temple you need to attend is, first of all, incredibly scandalous for a Jew to say. But it's got to be words of incredible hope for the Samaritan who has been locked out of any sort of worship for hundreds of years. Look what he keeps saying. The hour is coming Verse 23, and now is, is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So you Samaritans, worship what you don't know. You worship the false God with no truth. We Jews worship the true God. We worship what we know. And salvation comes from the Jews. Lady, you're staring at them. Salvation has come from the Jews. The gift of God has come in this Jewish man looking at you right now. And he says, the hour is coming and it's here. It's been fulfilled. It's here right now in front of you, lady. The hour is coming and is now here when the Father is seeking true worshipers and they will worship in spirit and in truth. The Father has sent out his Christ not so that the temple may be the place to worship any longer, but so that everyone in every nation may bow their knee to the Father. So they may sing praises to Him all over the world because God is spirit. God is not a temple. He doesn't dwell in the temple any longer. God dwells in His people. And His people in every nation, tribe, and tongue worship Him in spirit and in truth. You, Christian, here don't have to go to Jerusalem to worship God. And that is a wonderful blessing which comes only in the Messiah when you drink from the living water. Now, let's stop and just ask the question, what does it mean to worship in spirit and truth? This is, what true, this is how true worshipers worship, and so it's a good question. How do I worship in spirit and truth? I think this is just two characteristics of the worshiper. Okay? So I think when he says worship in spirit, he means sort of something like worship with your affections, okay? Or we could say feel what you worship. 
And by truth, we could say worshiping with sort of knowledge, knowing what you feel. So uh, feelings, I, I think your church knows this well, feelings on their own are, should not be trusted. But knowledge on its own simply puffs up and offers nothing. Knowledge without affection is vain. We can learn and read and know every bit of Greek and Hebrew that we want to know, but if we don't love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, it is for nothing. But if we try to love God without knowing who God is and knowing His Son, then we love ourselves. We worship, true worshipers of God, worship in spirit with our affections, and we worship truth, in truth. That is, we worship what we know. In verse 22, we worship what we know, and we know Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world on our behalf. We know the Father who loves us so much that He sent His own Son to die for us, and we know the Spirit who dwells with us now, day in and day out, correcting us and reproving us and welling up our affections to Christ. We worship what we know as true worshipers of Christ. She answers again, 25. I know that, she still doesn't get it. I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Uh, as I already said, the, the Samaritans have their own version of the Messiah. His name is Tabe. He's sort of this prophetic man after Moses who's going to teach them a lot of things. He doesn't really bring deliverance. Somebody's what he's coming for. And so even her version of the Messiah that she's speaking of here, it falls short of what Jesus is. And we, I think when, as readers, I think John wants us to be sort of just like in awe that this woman doesn't get it. John has already told us, he told us right off the bat what we're supposed to think about Jesus throughout these stories. For instance, in 141, he told us, he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Later in the same paragraph, we find out also that Jesus is the true Israel, a rabbi, the son of God, the king of Israel. He's also the son of man in verse 51. So when we're reading this with this woman, we know as readers who this is. This is the Messiah, the King of Israel, the true Israelite, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Savior of the world. And this woman doesn't get it. So finally, Jesus says to her, I who speak to you am he. Listen, woman, believe me because I am the Messiah. I am the new prophet from like Moses who has come, but I am more than that. I am the one who gives you living water, who satisfies every need that you could have. And there is an invitation here to all in this room to come and drink, because this is the Christ. This is the new Jacob who uh, brings up water so that we may drink so that you may be satisfied forever, because without Him, you will want and want and want and want and want and want and never find anything you will actually ever be satisfied in. I promise, I, I promise you there are people in this room who have chased the world and have never found the end. Listen, without God and without Christ in your heart and life and affections, you will want forever, and you will never find what you need. Uh, David Brainerd says that without God in the world, you could have every, uh, everything in the world, and yet you would be 10,000 times more miserable than a toad. And this is absolutely true, is that without Christ in the living water, you will want forever. But with Christ, your heart will be full of joy and love and satisfaction forever.
Now, if we've received this living water, and we have received this full satisfaction, the next question is, what do we do with it? And the call in the rest of the chapter is, go and get others to drink. Let's see what happens here. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming up to him. So look, first of the disciples, the disciples come. And as they're sort of walking up to Jesus, they see, oh, there's a woman talking to Jesus. And he's talking back to her. That's weird. But they don't ask any questions. They're going to ask a question here in 31. They don't ask any questions yet. But the woman's response, finally, it seems that she understands what Jesus is saying because she leaves the water jar and went away into the town. The very thing she came to the well for. She came to the well so that she would not be thirsty anymore. And she left her water jar. And I think John is subtly telling us she doesn't thirst anymore. She is drinking from the living water. She will never thirst again forever. She's going and she's telling her townspeople, come see a man. And he said, he told me all that I ever did. And I think a better, maybe a, a more clear translation here would be, surely this is the Christ. Or this can't not be the Christ. And we find out later in, um, uh, in the chapter that they believe because of this woman. They believe this is the Christ. And that's why they're coming up. So they're coming out of the town. And then 31, Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have, fa- I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Listen, the disciples do exactly what the woman does, that they take Jesus way too literally. Jesus says, there's food for me that you don't know. And they say, did he, somebody else bring him bread or something? And that's not Jesus' point. Jesus' point is, there is something far more satisfying than bread to my soul. And that thing is to do the will of the Father. And Jesus models for us just simply what an obedient follower of the Father looks like. But to be a true worshiper of the Father, it's not only worshiping in spirit and truth, but doing what the Father has told you to do. And in obeying, in obedience, there is full and divine satisfaction for your soul. Thirty-five. Do you not say... There are yet four months, then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Now they're looking, they're standing sort of on this hill where this well is, and the people of the town are coming up to them. So I think they can see all the people leaving the city and coming to them. And so when he says, lift up your eyes, he says, look at the people coming. Lift up your eyes and see the harvest is ready. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. Now in John's gospel, uh, I think we're meant to understand the reaper as Jesus himself. The sower was John the Baptist who prepared the way for the Lord. And now Jesus is here. The way is prepared. the The seed is sown and he is reaping fruit for eternal life. But he gives this as a model for all the disciples after him. That some sow, verse 37, and others reap. This is often the case. Preachers can preach in their pulpit for decades on decades and see no fruit. And then uh, when they are gone and a new preacher is in, the, the, he reaps the harvest that this preacher has been sowing. This is a universal sort of pattern which Jesus, I think, is setting forward to all who go to the nations. 
or stand in a pulpit or teach a family. One sows and another reaps. And he says, I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. The disciples are now charged with a new job. Your job is to do something you haven't worked for yet. Somebody else has been preparing the way for you. And your job, Cephas, John, Andrew, your job is to go into the harvest. Like the Samaritan woman. She's a model for what we ought to do, I think, too. She drinks from the living water and it is welling up in her fountains out of her soul, so much so that she can't not tell someone. And Christian, I want to ask you, is this this the type of joy that you find in God? You can't not tell somebody else when you're at work or even at home with your own children. When we feel the impact of the living water quench our soul, we want to say, I need to get this water to everyone else around me. That's what, the, that's what the Samaritan woman did. And now this is what we're charged with, with along with the disciples. is to go. Let's look at the fruit now of what she did. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of that woman's testimony. This is her testimony. He told me all that I ever did. It's just a quote back uh, to verse 29. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Now that's interesting, because he wouldn't stay with the Jews in chapter 2. The Jews apparently believed him, but he wouldn't entrust himself to them by staying there. So he left. And here, Gentiles believe into Christ. And he says, I'll stay here for two days. That's interesting. You'll, you know, if you're a good reader of John's Gospel, that one of his main points, and he's even going to bring it up here, that this is the Savior of the world, is that this is a message not just for the Jews, but for the nations. That for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. The world is who this message is for. And many more believed because of his word. Now, this is incredible. Verse 42. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. It is no longer because she said, hey, there's water that is really great. But it's because they came to the well and they drank themselves. And they have said, we don't believe just because you told us anymore. We believe because we no thirst anymore. We have seen for ourselves that this is certainly the Savior of the world. Now, in finishing some application here, um, as I've already stated, first, there's an invitation to you who do not know Christ to come and to drink. You can live your life for a year in and year out, trying to find happiness in the world, and you will never find it. But there's an invitation to you to come to the Father and to drink of living water at no price because He has done the work. All we ought to do is believe into Him, and we will have eternal life. There's an invitation for you, if you do not know Him, to come and to drink. You are, if you realize it or not, like this woman. Sinful in every way. Whether you realize it or not. Whether children, it is through disobeying your parents. Or dad, it is through, um, whether you act on it or not, anger welling in your heart when kids don't obey you. Or mom, simply um, dishonoring your husband. Men, if you looked at that woman the wrong way, there is sin in your heart which is far worse than you could ever believe. 
and there is only one thing which will give life to your dead bones. And that is this eternal, eternally satisfying water which the Son offers to you. Now you who have drink, how ought we to respond other than going to the nations? That's a big one. Though it's true, we ought to go not just to the nations, but lift up your eyes to your brothers in Indianapolis. They need the gospel. This is a depraved, I've only been here for two years, but this is a depraved city that needs the gospel. Lift up your eyes and see that the harvest is ready. But there are other ways to respond to this wonderful news of, of everlasting water. Um, and for those, I'd like to go to Isaiah several passages in Isaiah with you, and see what Isaiah calls us to do when we drink of this water. Isaiah 12 is the first place. Our first response from Isaiah 12 is to joyfully sing. 12.1, you will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And you will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among his peoples. Proclaim that he, his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitants of Zion. For great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. So Isaiah says, what is the response to drinking from the well of living water? Sing for joy. Sing. Isaiah 58 is where we'll go next. Isaiah 58. Um, and in context here, um, the Lord is describing the type of fast that He requires from His people. And He's describing the type of fast which He is pleased in. We'll start at, um, we'll just start at verse 11 here. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. So the response of our heart I think Isaiah is telling us through the Lord's mouth, the response of our heart should be, every desire is satisfied, even in scorched places. Last, in, from Isaiah, and this is quoted in Revelation. Isaiah 49. Isaiah 49. Uh, verse... 8 through 10. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favor I have answered you, in a time in a day of salvation I have helped you. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, speaking to the servant, to establish the land to apportion the desolate heritages, saying to the prisoners, come out, and those who are in darkness up here. They shall feed along the ways on all bare heights shall be their pastures. They shall not hunger or thirst. Neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them, for he, has had, he who has had pity on them will lead them, and by springs of water will guide them. Now, in Revelation, this is meant to be a comfort for those who have died and been martyrs. And the comfort to them is you have drinking from this living water that the Lamb offers, and thus you can rest forever. And so... By drinking of this living water, I think Isaiah, and I think these are texts that John has on his mind, Isaiah is telling us we drink from this living water and we can rest in the great arms of our shepherd who leads us by streams of water. And so the three that I think Isaiah offers is first, in response to the living water, we rejoice and sing with great joy that our King has saved us and quenched our thirst. Second, that we, our souls are satisfied from every other desire. And Christian, when you feel that way, 
Often when I don't feel that way in the Christian life, it is because my eyes have come off of Christ and onto myself. It's because I have started looking inwardly and instead of looking to the Lamb who was slain for me. So if you don't feel that way, look to Him. Third, in drinking this living water, you are called to come and rest in the arms of the shepherd. To be anxious no longer. To be worried for nothing. And Christian, there is a call to come, drink of the water, and go like the woman to your neighbor and ask them, come and drink from this ever-satisfying, perfectly good water that the Son offers to us. So they may worship the Father. They may be true worshipers of God in spirit and in truth. Christians, we have come to the greater Jacob. We have drinking from the greater water. Let's pray together. Uh, Father, thank you for uh, these wonderful texts that we have here in um, your scriptures. Thank you for the all-satisfying